Now, in all this, where where did uh, Accurate Records come from? Uh, well, um, in when I had the first either orchestra uh, recording, well, you, this would be spring of summer of '86. I'd taken the band to to a recording studio, um, and um, and we had some live recordings too. And I was like, okay, this sounds pretty good. Um, what do I do with it? And because I was coming out of the punk era, you know, and the the DIY, excuse me, the DIY thing. Mm-hmm. And also looking at Sun Ra, my my hero, who was the king of DIY. You know, I bought I bought many many Sun Ra LPs directly from Sun Ra. Like he handed them to me. You know, <laughs> did he do script, the cover? Did he do the covers he, and everything? He, he, he did. I, the, the only the one time that I actually had a conversation with him actually was about 1976, and he was or 77 somewhere in there. He was uh, playing a double solo piano gig with Paul Blay. Wow. This is like a once only, it only happened once in history. That sounds amazing. Blay was, Blay was, was recording him for his, his label, Improvising Artists. And, um, and it was in a little teeny place called Axis in Soho in, in New York. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, uh, it, what a, God, what a, I mean, I can't believe I was there. Um, Blaze said actually he issued as a record, it's called Axis. So you can actually hear that music that I heard that night. Sun Ra's thing, he wound up going to the studio and recording a solo album called St. Louis Blues, but it was that repertoire. Okay. But I, being the, the fearless little stoner that I was, I went back into, you know, and into the, the dressing room, which was like a closet, and to, to talk to Sun Ra. You know, I had to talk to Sun Ra. Sure. Or shake his hand, which, of course, you can't do now. Um, and, right, um, yeah, that's a, t- a thing of times past. <laughs> that's right. And, and so there he is sitting there in his, like, Sun Ra costume, with a, a box, you know, probably like 100 LPs, white cover, LP covers. I don't know if there was anything in them. And he's just sitting there with a magic marker, one at a time, doing like a, a scribbled artwork, taking out the other one. And I just walked in and he didn't look at me. He was just like, just doing his thing. You know, I probably watched him do it for like 10 minutes, you know, completely in awe with my little job drop. Sure. Dropping. And, I finally and he, said, he's in full like Venus yeah. outfit oh, yeah. and everything. Yeah, the, the Jupiter, yeah, the Saturn. Jupiter, yeah, Saturn. Saturn, Saturn. That's what that's it is. Yeah, Saturn. Planet, Saturn. Sorry, sorry, my bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> get your planets together. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's doing, you know, the, the Sun Ra. I mean, there's like the guy was not. There wasn't an on stage and an off stage for him. And uh-huh. and uh, so so I finally got the nerve to say, hey, that was great. Uh, you know. I love, can I, do you have any for sale? And I bought, you know, it was, he was selling it for $5. You know, I probably bought four LPs. And um, so Sunra's Sun Ra's sort of uh, grassroots approach to releasing music made an impression on me. And of course, Mingus and Max Roach had tried to do that with debut records. And then out of the loft jazz era, which is, was really a lot of big influence on me as a listener and as a young jazz aficionado, a lot of people were doing indie labels, tiny little labels in New York in the 70s, um, India Navigation and Akba, I think was Charles Tyler's label, which had you know two records on it, Jolie Wilson, all these, all of this heavy loft jazz people who I totally admired were putting out their own records. So when it, when the either orchestra had a tape, and I'd been in rock bands, as as I mentioned, chasing you know record contracts, I was like, Screw this! I'm, why waste? Why waste your time on that? Let me just put it out myself. You know. Sure. So, I, I by then I'd been through with other bands the process of putting out you know vinyl before, so it wasn't that hard to do. And uh, and and you know gathering my information, my radio information, and everything. Um, I, I put in uh, self self what did it say self addressed stamped cards in 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 the records when I sent them out because this was before people were doing that. And, and I had a little questionnaire, like, you know, how did, you know, about the record. How, what tracks did you play? Bother any comments? Are there venues in your area? Is this uh, to radio people in particular? This is to radio. I, I somehow somebody stole a, a really good radio list for me, so I had a really good mailing list of radio stations that played jazz around the United States. Uh-huh. And I sent out these records, these dial E for either orchestra, this wacky looking LP with, from this this with a, a picture of. Russian film director Sergei Eisenstein on the cover talking on a phone looking like this, <laughs> and, you know, and then the back, you know, the with, with like 
strange versions of brilliant corners, like a free jazz versions of brilliant corners, a, a funk version of Doxy, and you know, okay. just a, 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 like a, a slow drag version of a Rasan tune, mm -hmm. um, you know, plus some originals. And, and so it actually, I got it out to a lot of radio stations and a lot of them sent back these informational cards because people weren't doing that. It was a, a novelty. Sure. So I, I gathered a lot of information about radio, about just about venues around the United States. And uh, so I had, so I had this database and, um, and then we made our next record. And so I had a, a leg up on it and that record did even better. Radium it was called. Mm -hmm. um, and that one was a three format monster. It was CD, LP and cassette. And, I actually found a copy of that in a record store. I don't even remember where it was, but <laughs> I've got I've got an original copy. A vinyl uh, on vinyl, yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I have to give you a, a CD because there's there's more tracks on the CD. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a couple of pretty good ones we couldn't fit on, but um, uh, so so yeah. So I had and I put that one out, and then my friend Henry Cook, who's a great um, flute player and reed player, who I met at Berkeley. Um, was he was playing in in um, at Wally's a lot with a band called the Billy Skinner Double Jazz Quartet. Billy Skinner is a trumpet player who uh, he's probably he must be in his seventies by now. Um, who in the seventies was making a mark in New York. He was playing with Jackie McLean and was and and composed a lot of songs that Jackie recorded. Actually, he was, Billy's a really good writer, even more than a player. I mean, he's mm -hmm. a, um, and if you go back to some of Jackie's 70s recordings, you can find Billy Skinner on them and his tunes. And Billy was leading this band in uh, called the Double Jazz Quartet that had Henry in it. Also had um, the legendary Bobby Ward. I don't know if you know about Bobby Ward. That name's familiar, but I'm not sure. He's a Roxbury, you know, legend. He, he, he's younger than Alan Dawson and older than Tony Williams and was like in the the, the the string of sort of great drummers coming out of Roxbury, he was the man. Mm -hmm. And um, he was offered a chance to go on the road with Cannonball. Um, but uh, the story that I heard, I don't know if it's true or not, is that Bobby, who's a little bit of a hothead back then, a little less so when I knew him later, apparently got into um, an argument with Walter Booker, Cannonball's bass player, before they even went on the road. And so he, he lost the job. Oh, man, that's but tough. Really great, really original, very unusual drummer. Um, so Billy and Bobby and Henry and Salim Washington, who you may know, oh, yeah. uh -huh. was, in the, was in that band. And then a collection of bass players kind of went through who, who Bobby kept firing. And um, they made this wonderful record recording. And Henry came to me and said, what do I do with this? And I was like, shit, let's put it out. You know, I was like, I have distribution, which I got through my friend Louisa Hofstadter at Rounder. Mm -hmm. I have a mailing list. I know how to do it. I've, I've done a few of these things. So... So we put that one out and then other people started coming to me and saying, Hey, uh, how did you do that? And, and, and I, you know, can you give me some advice? And, and before I knew it, I was like, well, shit, why don't I just put it out? So, you know, within a couple of years, I put out 10 or 12 really good albums by local jazz people. Mm -hmm. The first, the first batch had a notrage of Phil Scarf, um, Dominique Eade, uh, who else was in that first? Emery Davis, a really good jazz violinist who moved to Paris long ago. Um, you know, really, really good document. Jay Branford, who who was a great um, saxophonist who's been living in New York for many years. It, I think I really helped document and get and expose to a wider public, you know, um, the Boston jazz scene of that, that period, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and it just evolved over the years. You know, I had different distribution deals and through the 90s it was actually a real business and we could really sell a decent amount of of um almost anything and we sold a lot of some things i had the i i, I essentially reissued the first modesty martin and wood record uh -huh. which uh when they were putting it out the first time self-releasing it i was like guys i've got distribution and i helped them name it and i you know helped them with it but uh -huh. it was what's the friend. name of that record Notes from the Underground. Yeah, that's right. In fact, in yeah. fact I named it. Is that um, right? Yeah. <laughs> A little Dostoevsky for you. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, but Billy Martin wanted to have his own label, which, of course, was, and he, did, he put it out. And it, he didn't, but he didn't have the infrastructure. And then they got busy with the road and stuff, and then they started to take off. And a couple albums later, two or three years later, um, when they were starting to take off, I said, hey, dudes, 
let me put this out for you. You'll get a better royalty rate from me than anybody. And you guys are hot now. We can sell these things. And we sold a shitload of them. And that was a really good, you know, that was a great thing. And there were some other jam bandy kind of bands that, that were touring and kind of on that circuit that sold fair fair number of records. And so in the, in the 90s, it was like a real business. Um, sure. And you've got a lot of really amazing artists on there. I mean, you put out a lot of great records. And yeah, if you really, look the, yeah. And an interesting, kind of eclectic, but super creative group. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I never put out anything, at least for the first, first, you know, many, many years, I never put out anything that I really didn't love. Mm -hmm. You know, I think maybe a little toward the end of the nineties, I I don't want, I'd want to impugn anybody. I think, I think everything that I put out was really good. Some, maybe some of them I didn't fall in love with later on, but the first half of the catalog, I was just madly in love with, with every record in some way or other. And so I think that probably gave it some kind of cohesion, cohesion. Um, sure. And I'm sure it's, it's, it's gotta be fulfilling to be able to use that skill set that you built up to be able to get the music out to people. It seemed like a waste for me to only put out one or two, one record every year or two when I knew how to do it. Uh, um, and, um, yeah, I, I felt proud that I was able to just project this Boston scene, which is always overlooked you know, yeah. historically for, for, you know, obvious reasons, New York is 200 miles down the road and that's where the music business is. And that's where the, you know, that's the capital of jazz for the world. Um, but I, I was glad that I was able to get us, the either orchestra and, and a lot of Boston people get our names out around. Now, of course, toward the end of the nineties, um, as a distribution, you know, we got, it, it, the, the, it became complicated, financially and business wise. And we, I got a big sort of pressing and distribution deal with rounder records. And then that, that collapsed and it left, I went, got left holding the bag financially for a lot of stuff that uh, I don't really want to get too detailed about. Sure. And then at the end, and then around 2001, 2000, 2001, when the internet really started picking up steam, as far as music distribution goes, um, my biggest distributor my, my, you know, my 90% distributor, which was a huge company, went bankrupt wow. and, and bankrupted, stiffed the music world for $200 million. I mean, Sony, was a, Sony, you know, was at the top of the list for 20, 20 million. I was further down the list, but a significant, significant amount of money for me. So that, sure. that was kind of, that was kind of the beginning of the end of the record biz as an actual financially sensible thing to do. 